Hi folks, John O'Brien here, your asynchronous instructor for History 1510. Uh, if you're just joining us for the first time, um, please download or at least view the syllabus available on our Blackboard. Blackboard is our learning management system. It's accessible through the sunyjcc.edu, go to myjcc, and a lot of stuff there. Banners where you can register for courses. We've done that already. Uh, Blackboard is the learning management system for all of our courses this semester since we have all gone online. Degree, degree Works will let you know where you stand with respect to your degree attainment. Uh, there's your Google email. Starfish is a, a great way to see when your instructors are in their offices to contact them. Uh, and then other stuff I'm not really sure about. So uh, Blackboard, <laughs> there's enough here to keep us busy. Blackboard, click on Blackboard, uh, you have a username, it's the first part of your student email address and then your password, I think originally is your birth date, make sure you change that, um, especially if you're as old as I am, you don't want, want anyone to know that. And uh, you will come across a list of all the courses you're taking, these are the things I am teaching, and this CRN number is really important, alright, so CRN is... Uh, I don't know what it stands for. It's the computer name for the course. And especially now, since we are really online, some asynchronous like this, not meeting in real time, others in real time via Zoom, and a few in flex mode, uh, where it's half Zoom and, and half in class, and actually even a smaller number uh, actually physically meeting in the classroom, specialized courses. Um, it's tough to keep track of, at least for me, what class I am in, since I'm not in the class, in the beautiful studios of YMCA Camp Panassa right now, where it's the other part of my life. Uh, but you guys are, are 4771, and you click on it, and you wait, and you wait. Okay, there we go. Uh, so how does this work? There's a whole lot of content that will be coming at you. Um, let me shift into student mode, so you can't see what I can see, usually. And content... Wow, chapter one to our textbook, chapter two to our textbook, chapter, no, not chapter three. I'm only allowed to put up a few chapters, or else the publishers, Grot Hill, will probably get angry at the inability to sell textbooks. But I do have the first couple chapters up there so you can get the textbook, speaking of which, it is published by McGraw Hill. Those aren't people anymore. That is the name of the publishing house. The book is actually entitled Traditions and Encounters. Make sure you get volume one. Small uh, subtitle, from the beginning, whenever that was, all right, until 1500, okay? So this course is history before 1500, all right? That's volume one. Uh, it's by Bentler, Z Bentley, Ziegler, and Salter, uh, three authors. Bentley actually has passed away, but he was a kind of foremost world historian. And world history actually is a rather, rather new field, believe it or not, right? There's a whole lot of national histories. Uh, we'll talk about in this lecture, the history of history, and we'll see that uh, a lot of, you know, kind of privileged white guys, especially in Europe and United States as well, put together the field of modern history and talked about how great their own countries were, all right? So we're going to talk about, in a different sense, not nationalistic history, but the world, a okay? global experience before the modern era, 1500. Historians like to draw lines in time because it's just too much, right? 6,000 years of history since we've had cities and writing and having organized societies, it's a bit much to take in at once. So we take that big meal and cut it into bite-sized pieces, so to speak, right? So the last 500 years, we typically term the modern era. You see how historians also like to round off of the nearest 500. And the stuff before that, uh, at least from the beginning of, of civilization, really, of cities uh, arising about 6,000 years ago, we call the pre-modern. So this course is pre-modern history. Think not to be too Eurocentric or egocentric, before 1492, all right? When we suddenly start to have this Atlantic uh, connection, okay, 1492. Anyway, uh, so you've got a couple chapters up there, so you can, no excuse, start reading chapter one and while you wait for your textbook to arrive. Or there is an ebook version of this. Uh, I have required the sixth edition of the text. By the way, this book is now in its seventh edition. Super expensive. So get the used one. It's fine. Somebody wrote in. Who cares, right? Um, 
this is the one I use, the one I will be using. So if I say, turn the page, you know, 321, that's in the sixth edition. If you have the seventh, it might be a different page. If you have the fifth edition, that will work. It'll probably be really cheap because uh, those are not a big market for the fifth edition, which is probably like 10 years old. Uh, that'll work, but just keep in mind it's not exactly the same, especially the pagination. The pages will be different, okay? So a couple chapters up there, and then our syllabus. Again, well, we went through this previously. I guess you, you don't need to review, really. You can just watch the YouTube video prior to this one. But we are asynchronous, big word meaning. We're not meeting in real time. And you can watch this whenever you want, okay? Hopefully after a full cup of coffee, right? Um, you can call me, John. Uh, when are you going to speak to me? Well, call me. <laughs> call me by telephone. Uh, email me. Let's make sure we are communicating. So I went through this last time. You can watch the YouTube video on that. Um, we will, I will try to lecture three times per week for about 50 minutes each episode. Call it an episode. Uh, that's the required number of minutes per week. Just shorter than three hours per week for a, oh, a three credit hour course. That's how they work out, right? Remember, we have four exams. Uh, I've taken world history prior to 1500, divided into four relatively equal pieces, uh, about four or five chapters each, one exam per unit. Uh, they'll be administered on through Blackboard. They'll consist of five essays, four essays from the textbook and lecture, and one essay hmm, from current events. Current events, I will be posting articles related to like current history, what's going on today uh, on Blackboard. In fact, I already did that, so you can read those four articles it's just one article per week. We have four weeks really until our first exam. So one essay question on the current stuff and four essay questions on the textbook and lecture, which again, usually corresponds to about four chapters, sometimes five. There'll be 10 quizzes. So during the weeks when we don't have a, an exam and not this week, we'll post quiz, I will, who's we? we will, I will post quizzes uh, based upon the chapters, right? Actually post 11 and drop the lowest one. So we get 100 points from 10 quizzes, hmm, 10 points each, plus 400 points from four exams, 100 points each. That's 500 points uh, from that I, I pretty easily compute your grade at the end of the semester. However, there are extra credit uh, points available, five points per unit, times four units, that's 20 points for attending. How do I know you're attending? Please engage in the Blackboard forum, right? That's a discussion board. Talk about the lecture, um, maybe not last time so much, because what could you do as a syllabus? Um, but, but let's start, to, uh, we'll ask questions and try to respond to them, or ask your own in the thread. Uh, I will post one for this lecture, it'll be on what we call historiography, the history of history, like what do historians do, and why, and how, and when do they look, you know, well, what periods are they interested in, where, right? So the who, what, why, when, and how of history. It's called historiography. Um, everything else is, I think, fairly self-explanatory. You guys are really autonomous, okay? Um, you can really on your own, independently, watching this whenever you want. I had a fellow last semester when COVID hit and we switched to this mode, entirely this mode, said this was really good for him because in class I tend to speak rather quickly. Folks, I have 4,500 years of history to cover in 15 weeks. Of course I speak quickly. And he would kind of uh, rewind once in a while, kind of watch the video a couple times. I uh, bless him for doing that. If you want to talk to me in a slower mode, please feel free to call me at that number, uh, the number on the syllabus. It's my, actually my campus number. You will probably need to leave a message. Hi, this is Joe. I'm in your asynchronous class, uh, World History Before 1500. And my number is, and give you a number. Our system at the, on campus will send me an email, which I will pick up on my phone, and then I will call you back. Okay, that's the maybe a little bit clunky way of reaching me this semester. Sometimes I will be in my office, I'm scheduled to be in my office, Tuesdays and Thursdays from like 9.45 to 12.45. So if you want to reach me, I'm probably in the office then, unless I'm taking a coffee break or something, right? We can also Zoom one-on-one, -on -one, um, or you know, email me and we can kind of set that up. The last part of the syllabus, about a chapter per week. Unfortunately, our textbook doesn't have 15 chapters, so 
trying to crunch 19 chapters into 15 weeks. I had to cheat a little bit, right? Once in a while we double up. Um, but, 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 but so be it, okay? There's a lot to cover in world history, and they just, they just couldn't do it in 15, 15 uh, chapters. So uh, we will be moving into chapter one in my next lecture, like before history. And that covers a whole lot of ground, right? Human beings evolved over millions of years, uh, and we do like millions of years in one chapter, and it's fairly thin. It's like the thinnest chapter of all. That's because it deals with archaeology and anthropology, really the expertise of other people in our school. Okay, so talk to Shannon Bizet, sign up for anthropology if you want to talk about prehistory. We really pick up the story, right, history, uh, once people start to write things down. And we can read them, even if it's a big clay tablet with stuff etched in it, uh, in hard clay, uh, baked clay. Uh, I can't read cuneiform, I'm sure you can't either, but specialists can and translate it into modern English. So once we get writing, we get cities, we get highly organized societies, historians kind of uh, pick up the story. And that only arose about 6,000 years ago, okay, in southern Iraq. Okay. That doesn't mean, by the way, uh, we don't want to bias people, societies that didn't have writing, uh, some very sophisticated societies in, in world history uh, did not have writing. Like, why would you need writing? I remember being on an, uh, an island in the Caribbean, the, the island where we think Columbus first showed up in 1492 and being all columbus -y, right? I have writing, I have Christianity, I have civilization, and who are these people? Well, those people uh, didn't need writing. Okay, it's a very small island, and they probably knew everyone else. They knew what to eat, what not to eat, how to fish. They, they didn't need writing. You and I do, so no excuse for us not knowing how to uh, write well and to read well. But not all societies have needed that, right? So there can be sophistication without writing. Okay? So it's not biased writing, but it is rather convenient for us to look at those early written sources and interpret them. More about that in a few minutes as we get into the lecture. All right. So if you have questions on the syllabus, please email me. That is our core document for the semester. Goodbye syllabus, go away. Um, I'm going to, since I do not have a camera person, make sure my camera is still camera-ing. Is that a verb? Probably not. Uh, sometimes it just shuts off and I'm like, not only am I standing here alone, I'm, sta I'm talking to a camera that's not functioning. So let me check that real quick before I waste more time. Yes, okay, great, okay. Still have an image there, okay. Historiography. What is the history of history? Hmm? Well, the discipline of history. You could say history is everything that's ever happened. Well, that'd be true, but that textbook would be even more expensive than the one we have, right? So we're talking about a discipline, kind of a capital D discipline, a uh, field of study that actually requires some discipline, okay, to do this. So it's an academic process. What, where, when, and who of history? What is history? History is a study of change within civilization. It's an inquiry. Uh, really among the first historians we know much about were the ancient Greeks, the classical Greeks, about 2,400 years ago. And a guy named Herodotus is like just staying up all night writing stuff down, and his friends wanted him to go drinking. Come on, man, let's go to the symposium. Just went at a drinking party. And they said, what are you doing? Go, I'm doing an historia, right? which means I'm doing an inquiry. Inquiry, that means asking questions about the past. He's actually uh, writing about his people going to war with their neighbors. Where? Where does history happen? Well, it happens in your own personal life, right? This rule of micro-history. Biography, in many ways, is history, right? Family history, local history, regional history. Uh, you, know, you could look at the United States say state history. It's kind of the most boring thing of all, but that's actually what I'm looking at right now in New York. Uh, national history, we try to shy away from that a bit because that often is a bit exceptionalist, like my country is better than any other country. Uh, we look at transnational history now. Even when we teach U.S. history, it's like not just stopping at the borders. We look at the United States interaction with the global, within the global context. Uh, transnational history, then, is more of a global focus. And here you are. I already sold you on that. When does history happen? Good question. When does history start? Some historians start with the Big Bang. Are you kidding me? 14 billion years ago? Yes, there's a whole movement to start history with the, the, the origin of time itself. I'm not going back that far, okay? I'm, I've got enough to deal with just with the beginning of writing in cities and societies. 
Um, but some historians, hey, more power to them, go back to the beginning of the cosmos, okay, about 13.8 million years ago. Um, some historians pick up the story with the evolution of Homo sapien, sapien sapien, thinking humans. Uh, really, for our course, we're a little more narrowly defined. We pick it up with the beginning of civilization. Like, what's a civilization mean? Civitas, cities, writing, highly organized societies. Okay? So it's a bit arbitrary when we begin the story of change. What about peoples without cities and writing? I mentioned that already. That doesn't mean they were inferior. Okay? It does not mean they were inferior. That's a very imperialistic notion. Those people don't have writing. We should conquer them and take all their stuff. They're savages, right? That's a very late 19th century mentality, which doesn't fly well in a woke era like our own, okay? So we are going to uh, help to, you know, work to understand and uh, even honor the achievements of people who didn't have cities in writing. Actually, the creation of cities, we're learning now, I even learning things in history, is in many ways a function of nutrition, right? People who couldn't grow enough uh, the proper nutrition, especially amino acids uh, in their foods, couldn't settle for long. And if you don't settle for long, you tend not to do things like make cities, right? You, you hunt, you gather, you fish, that type of thing, right? So it doesn't mean it. A lot of history is just luck. A fancy way of saying that is contingency. Who do we study? Well, <laughs> yeah, the modern discipline, not those old Greek white rich guys, 24 years ago, but like, you know, the guys 140 years ago or so in the uh, University of Berlin or Harvard or, you know, Oxford, um, they wrote about how great their own countries were and how history was past politics and politics present history. Well, no, okay, history is more than just politics. It's more than just the story of the so-called triumph of white men. Um, it's more than just how great your nation is compared to others. Wow, what did that thinking lead to by you know, 1914? Oh my God, right? So let's keep that in mind. The history, history itself has a history, right? So we're trying to grow and mature and understand that. What we should try to do is be students who understand the past objectively. Okay? Objective facts. You have an opinion, I have an opinion. Frankly, so what? Unless our opinions are based upon objective facts, right? evidence, our opinions really don't matter. Okay? Um, why do you care about my opinion? Unless I base it on the facts. And if we would call that an interpretation. Okay? Next slide. Slide person. Um, how do we pursue? This is the how of history. And I am again going to check my camera. Sorry, folks. Wow, still functioning. Okay, so when we do history, we go through a process. We look at primary sources. Primary sources aren't more important than secondary sources. They just come first, right? This is the evidence. Imagine as a historian, you're a detective. What's the evidence? You've got to collect the evidence. Well, sometimes it's already collected, but you need to gather the evidence and look at it and investigate it. Right? So are primary sources still around? That means extant, still in existence. Are they valid? Wow, I can't read, I can't wait to read Donald Trump's autobiography. Uh, not really, all right? Is it going to be truthful? Sorry to be too political, but look, let's be objective here, okay? Uh, I don't care if it's uh, Bill Clinton or you know, anyone, right? Um, their autobiography, what they write about themselves, eh, you got to be real careful there, right? So are things valid? People lied in the past, just like people are dishonest today. What's the context, right? What's going on outside of that evidence? So here, kind of a ship slide. This is actually Christopher Columbus's writing in the margin. Uh, I'm going to make this up a little bit. You Columbus experts who might be watching, but this, I'm making this up a little bit, exaggerating. Well, you know, on the morning of October 12, 1492, I rushed to the bow of the Santa Maria and I saw land. I was the first guy who saw land and praise, praise the Lord or something, right? Um, no, I'm sure he wasn't. He was probably sleeping, you know, in the captain's quarters and poor guy swabbing the deck saw land first. Um, Oh, these native people came out, they were half naked. He does actually write about the 